Okay, so we start now. The first talk is by Chad Blavins, I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, from USAID, the US Agency for uh, International Development. And his talk is about interpreting imagery for OpenStreetMap. So thank you, Chad. Can you hear me? Okay. All right, good morning, everyone. <coughs> Hi. Um, so I'm here with, on behalf of the United States Agency for International Development, um, where I work on a team, the GeoCenter, which is a small team of geographers within a very large agency. And we work to implement and use geographic data to help some of the decisions that USAID has to make. So some of you may be aware, but USAID has a presence in about 100 countries globally. So there's people working all over the place all the time. And as we all know, there is a lack of geographic data in many of the countries and places around the world. Um, we have a network within USAID of about 80 GIS specialists about. and. You know, we always hear this, this repeated question from them, you know, we need more localized data, we need data of the places where we work, and obviously OpenStreetMap is a great solution to help provide some of that information to them. <clears throat> and getting the, the local context is extremely important. So one of the things that we did um, a couple years ago under the leadership of Patricia Solis was launched the Youth Mappers program. And the Youth Mappers program is the GeoCenter's solution to creating that really detailed geographic data that USAID implementers and local governments can use to help make those types of decisions. And this is really a, a two-part program. So there's the remote mapping piece that a lot of us are familiar with, where we're looking at satellite imagery and we're tracing features from that imagery. And then, you know, there's also the field data collection piece. And we know this is a two-part process. And in many cases, it's really important to lay that, that groundwork and the base map, create that base map from imagery before you go out into the field to do that field data collection, or else it's really hard to orient yourself and figure out where you are and what you're doing. <clears throat> So some of you may be familiar with this image right here. Um, it's called the Blue Marble. It was taken by astronauts on their way to the moon back in the 70s. I think they kind of looked out the back window of the spacecraft and saw this full image of the Earth and took this picture. Um, it's one of the most famous pictures of the Earth ever. So a couple weeks ago, I was playing marbles with my five-year-old son, Carter. And, uh, you know, he has this big box of marbles, and he likes to play all kinds of games, throw them around the house, make a big mess, pick up the marbles, and tell me what they look like. It's like, oh, Dad, this looks like Mars, and this looks like a cat's eye, and this looks like an orange. And he picked up, it's actually this marble right here, and he said, Dad, this marble looks like the Earth. And when he said that, this image came to my mind, and I was like, oh, man. I've got to show Carter this picture and ask him what he thinks. So the next night after dinner, I, I pulled this up on my computer and I said, Carter, what is this a picture of? He's five years old. He's like, Dad, that's the Earth. I said, okay, you're right. Well, how do you know it's the Earth? And he put his hands down. And he's like, Dad, trust me, that's the Earth. <laughs> I wasn't doubting him at all, trusting a five-year-old. So I said, well, Carter, what is it about that image that makes you know that it's the Earth? And he said, well, you, look, Dad, you can see brown. There's land. You can see the green forest. You can see the blue ocean. You can see the white clouds in snow. He says, look at the bottom. You can even see Antarctica. And he pointed that out to me. I didn't really notice beforehand, but the coastline of Antarctica is actually pretty phenomenal in this picture. And that's where penguins are from, so he loves, he loves uh, anything related to Antarctica. So that got me thinking, and I was like, here's a five-year-old who's telling me what he's seeing and interpreting an image. And so this is something that he didn't learn in school. Uh, it's something that you're born with. And each of us is born with the ability to use our eyes and our brains together to help, and our experiences on life, to help 
understand what it is that we're actually looking at. And there's actually a whole psychology behind this, Gestalt psychology, where the whole is something other than the sum of its parts. And if you look closely at this image here on the screen, it might just look like a bunch of black and white blob, but if you look closely, you can see that in the middle of this scene, there's a Dalmatian that's bending over, drinking out of a bowl. Raise your hand if you see that. All right, cool. Um, and that's something that you may not have seen when you first brought this up, um, but once I tell you that that picture is there, it's hard not to see it. And we know what that is because we're humans and all of us know what a Dalmatian is. We've seen them in the movies, we've seen them in real life, we've seen them riding the fire truck, right? Um, and this is where humans in our experience on Earth have a distinct advantage of interpreting imagery over some of the machine processes that are out there. Using machines to support the work that we're trying to do, I think is a fantastic effort. Um, I'm excited about everything that's going on in that field, but at the end of the day, it does take the human touch to actually create the map and validate everything that we're looking at. Uh, <clears throat> so the next thing I want to do is just walk through a couple examples here and we'll go over some of the elements of remote sensing to help you have a better understanding of how your brain and body work together and your experiences to help determine what you're looking at and I think by doing that it'll help you become a better photo interpreter or an imagery interpreter and this is something that you have to practice at we're all born with this natural talent but it's just like anything else playing an instrument the more you practice it the more you think about it the more that you realize what you're actually doing and focus in on those fine details the better you're going to become so this is a picture of a mountain in West Darfur Sudan uh, and just looking at this right off the break it looks like a set of lips, right? And it's, it's called sort of like the lips mountain or the desert lips. Um, and what is it that makes it look like human lips, right? This is a mountain, it's a natural feature. Well, obviously there's the shape. It's just shaped like a set of lips. There's the color. It has a different tone to it than the surrounding desert and everyone's lips have a different color than their face. Uh, there's the shadow and the height. If you look in the middle of that image, there's a ridge line that goes across the middle and um, <clears throat> it creates, sort of separates the top lip from the bottom lip, and there's that texture. There's a, a more of a, the, the surrounding area has a, um, a smoother texture than the mountain itself. Um, looking in Kathmandu, Nepal, this is another area that's extremely difficult to map, one of the first areas that I've mapped. Um, there's all the elements of remote sensing going on here. Extremely difficult place to map. I think it would give a computer a really hard time to extract features from here, but if you look closely, you'll see the shadows of the roads. You can't see the roads themselves, but you can see the shadows, some of the different colors, the shapes, the patterns of the buildings, the different heights of the rooftops. There's lots of features and things going on on the rooftops, gardens and water tanks and water heaters. Um, and just knowing where you are, well, this is Kathmandu, and then combining that with the local knowledge that you have. Um, and if you've actually been in Nepal and looked down an alleyway like this, which is very common, you'll see why it's so difficult to extract features and to actually see that road. There's all kinds of uh, laundry lines and um, flags and beams supporting the two buildings in between. So although there is an actual alley there, uh, it's very difficult to see from up above. <clears throat> Moving just a little bit south, then Kuna, Bangladesh. This is an agriculture area in the country. And um, we all know that this is an agriculture area just by looking at it. And why do we? Because of the shape, the size, and the pattern of those agriculture fields around um, <clears throat> in this image. There's also a, if you look in the northeastern portion of the scene. There's a river that kind of comes down. It looks like it's not flowing a lot of water at this time of the year. How do we know that? Well, there's some green algae kind of sitting on the top. If you look about uh, just left of where it says color, there's a distinct line there that's blocking some of the algae flow. So we know that there's something that's impeding the flow of water if it is in fact flowing um, right there in that spot. And again, knowing that this is in Kulna, Bangladesh gives you a better understanding of the types of crops they grow and why some of these agriculture fields have the scattered pattern look that they do because 
from a ground perspective, you can see that they've defied, devised a way of conducting and create um, of agriculture in this part of the world that allows them to grow crops year round when the country's underwater flooded or when it's dry. And you can see this barrier here with a little drain pipe that's allowing them to drain water from one field to another. Um, my hometown here, Washington, D.C., the USAID office is right just out of sight of this image. But this is a classic example of height and shadow with the National Monument. You know, using some photogrammetric techniques, you can calculate the height of the National Monument. It's 555 feet. Um, we also know from this scene, due to the color and the shape of, of the trees, that it's fall because the trees are changing color um, and it's beginning to lose their leaves. There's also still, if you look closely, quite a large number of tourists out there on the mall. Those little black dots. You can pick that up in the texture of the green. Uh, might be somewhat dry this time of year because some of the, the grass is, is turning brown. Uh, and you'll see here on the left side, there's um, the World War II Memorial, which is a, a pond of water, and you can clearly see that there's a fountain there that's shooting up water around because that water is not a consistent color blue, but there's some white um, disturbance indicating that, yep, in fact, that is a fountain shooting water looking out on the mall with all the tourists and the, the trees. Um, this is one of the more interesting scenes um, places, and this stumped me as a photo interpreter for years, what we're actually looking at. Well, this is obviously center pivot irrigation. Um, it's in southern province in Zambia. You can tell by the color and the shape and the size that, you know, there's some crop being grown here. Uh, if you knew anything about center pivot irrigation in this part of the world, you'd be able to somewhat guesstimate the size of those circles just due to the the, the type of equipment that they use. Is it 50 meters? Is it 100 meters? You know, what's the common um, size of equipment? Uh, looking down at the pond in the lower right, it almost looks like it's a frozen lake. Well, in fact, it's not. It's just like a reflection of sun making it look almost frozen or like ice. Um, but the most interesting thing in this scene to me as a, as a photo interpreter are all these little what look to be bushes or trees that are scattered about. And if you look in that middle circle, um, just past where it says shape on the top, you can see that the green area has, is a little discolored and there's some lightish spots to that. And what those are, in fact, and this took me a long time to figure out, those are termite mounds. And the termites will grow and they, everyone's probably seen a termite mound somewhere in the tropics. They grow very tall and uh, skinny and when they reflect even the smallest shadow, it makes them appear like bushes. And what the farmers have done here is they've gone through and they've cleared the termite mounds out in the center area where it says shape and um, the termites have made such an impact on the earth that you can still see some of the discoloration going on even after those mounds have been removed. Uh, and this is a picture of one of those mounds from um, a perspective on earth. And the last example, this is a really cool one. Um, it's just an awesome thing to look at from imagery. This is in the southern San Francisco Bay. And what these are are salt evaporation ponds. Um, and it's a, a project that, where they're harvesting salt from the bay. And they create each one of these ponds. Um, so there's the patterns of the ponds. There's the shape of the ponds. Um, and knowing anything about salt evaporation and the microbes that take place and that cause this discoloration in the water, you could be able to, you could determine just by looking at this that, hey, these ponds here that are red are closer to harvesting the salt than the ones that are green out here uh, on the periphery. And I'm not a salt expert by any stretch of the imagination, but um, it's, a, it's a good example of, of using color and shape as an indicator. And even looking up in the upper right hand corner of the scene here, you can see that there's these bigger buildings that are indicating an industrial area of um, the city. And then just looking up in the very, very tip, there's obviously more residential because there's smaller buildings and there's that pattern that you can see. So <laughs> with that, you know, I just want to, you know, reemphasize the importance of people, you and I, in the mapping process and how important it is to have that local knowledge and that local context when you're mapping. Uh, one of the reasons that you know, we at USAID 
launched the Youth Mappers program was to get more university students involved, um, local university students involved, to give that, that perspective that they have of living in that country and knowing what it is that they're looking at. Um, so with all the advancements that are taking place like net right now with um, deep learning and machine learning, and I am going to sit in those talks and, and listen because it's a fascinating topic for me, uh, at the end of the day it really comes down to the human touch and the experiences that we have living on this earth and, and what it is that we decide to put on the map and how it should be tagged. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, you know, there's tons of amateurs in OpenStreetMap. We have access to good imagery, um, we often have, um, but we lack the training, or many of us lack the training to actually uh, deduce all the things that, that you've just shown. Is there anything, like any kind of literature or good websites or something that you can recommend for the interested amateur to sort of hone their, their skills when it comes to detecting facts from, from imagery? Yeah, you know, I, I did some searching around um, when I was creating this presentation, and there is some stuff on the internet. A lot of it is academic-based. Um, so there's presentations from remote sensing courses that are online that you can review. Nothing really good that I saw. Um, you know, Patricia uh, kind of has asked me a couple times that, Chad, maybe you should put something like this together and create a resource like a wiki or something on the, on the OpenStreetMap wiki to give a better explanation of what some of this is. Because I think you're right. And, you know, working with these students and going to mapathons all over the country, or all over the world, rather, um, the one question that you always get, you know, students figure out the tools really quick, but they say, hey, you know, what is this I'm looking at? Is that, is that a building? Is that a shadow? Is that a wall? Is that a ditch? Uh, and I think this white thing out here in the courtyard is a perfect example. If you looked at, at that white thing from imagery, you'd be like, what? what is that white thing? And I'm standing right next to it looking at it, and I'm like, what is that white thing? <laughs> Obviously it's art, but <laughs> that could fool you uh, if you're looking at it from space. So yeah, I, I think that one of the next things I'll do is try and put some resources together for the community. Thanks. Okay, if uh, there are no more questions. Oh, there is a question, sorry. Regarding what you can do to better learn how to interpret images, um, one suggestion I would add is uh, what you also showed that compare what you see in the images with your real world experience on the ground. If you look at images from areas where you know how, what this is, where you have a first hand experience, that's a very good training to interpret images because it lets you then later also correctly interpret images from areas where you don't have ground experience. That's true, yeah, searching the internet just for that area and trying to get some ground level photos is, is really helpful. Hi Chad, great talk. Um, yes, it would be fantastic if you could put some more stuff together, um, but perhaps that would be a really great youth mappers project so that they can actually put some you know, local context I think so. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion. Thanks for the presentation, Chad. Um, just realized we had tracing guides, which were examples of uh, imagery and how they translate to OpenStreetMap features. And we have uh, photos in the ID editor that show the same features from the ground, but we don't have tracing guides inside OSM editors. And so maybe put in more of the, those imagery examples directly inside the editors might be a, better, a good idea. 
That's not a bad idea. And, and you know, I have put together a, a bunch of tracing guides for specific projects that I've created. And, um, you know, you end up having to do that almost for every single project just because there's such a diversity of mapping areas in the world where if you're even on the inner city of Kathmandu where it's super duper dense or the outskirts, right? There's almost like a different technique that you need to apply. Um, That's it. That's you can build them and be contextual to the to the mapping. If anyone has the technical skills to do that, come talk to me and I'll, <laughs> I'll work with you. Okay, so I think we can thanks Chad for his presentation. Thanks, thank you.